with all the success you've had, do you still face? Is there? Do you? Are you currently facing any fears, or are there fears about the horizon? Man, I, I have to give you amazing props. You're such a curious person about the people that you talk to. I love it. I love it, man. Thank you. The answer is, you know, thank you. Are you kidding me? I've been on a ton of podcasts and people just same questions. Welcome to the Idea Climbing Radio Show. We're here with Dr. Barrett Matthews. We're going to talk about media and sharing your big idea Yay. by leveraging media. And I'd love to jump right in, Barrett. How did you discover the media world and why do you love it so much to do everything you've been doing in it? Well, you know, it's funny that you asked that question. I, uh, in college, I thought I wanted to be an architect. So I went in as an architecture major, which was kicked my butt royally. And I knew I needed to change my major because architecture was not getting any easier. And I didn't know what I wanted to change my major to. And my sister said to me, well, you've always been interested in radio and television and stuff. And my response was, well, isn't everybody? I, I didn't I didn't think of it as a major. I honestly didn't. And I changed my major. My grades shot up. My interest shot up. I was I started being able to breathe again and have a little fun with no pressure from the architecture. And I, I, it just really was something that I assimilated to. And it just made me made me very comfortable. And I enjoyed it. And that's when I knew, I, yeah, this is something I want to do. At least you discovered it early on and didn't wait until you were 40 or 45 to figure out, I need to switch <laughs> lifestyles. Well, <laughs> it's okay, easier to switch that's majors. True. That is true, but I did change majors. They did keep me in school the next few years. So. <laughs> <laughs> what was the first media that you learned about that you really gravitated towards? Oh, good question. Um, it, was, it was either television or radio. Because when I was in college, you know, I, I could, I, we, had a, we had a media department. And I was, I, I kind of dove right in. So I was, a, I ended up being the, the sports uh, sports director for the radio station. I, I hosted the post-game TV show. I was the sportscaster on a news show we had there. I even wrote uh, for the school newspaper. But it was probably between the radio show, the radio and the, tele, and the post-game stuff. I think it was probably radio first because I, I remember I wanted to go and do play-by-play -play for the games. And it was interesting, and this is for any any of you young people listening out there. Uh, I, I had a I went to the producer for the the radio station, and I told her that I wanted to call games, and she said to me, she said, "I don't think you can do it," and I'm like, "Why?" And she says, "Well, because you don't seem to have the energy needed." I said, "There's not a game going on." <laughs> <laughs> I don't it's know. like dancing without music. It does not right. work. Exactly. The same. So she gave me a shot. It wasn't live. It was recorded. She let me record myself calling the game at the next game. Next thing you know, I am the lead guy doing doing play by play. I actually ended up sometimes doing color because I could switch back and forth. But I was the guy for, for years to come after that to where now, then it was they actually named me the sports the sports director for the radio station. Well, for everything else that we're going to talk about here, you just gave a great lesson. Ask. If there's something you want, ask for it. So many people are afraid to yeah. make that ask. And was it yeah. scary to you? Do you remember? It wasn't, actually. It was just one of those things. Hey, if she said no, she said no. But I figured <laughs> I, I had nothing to lose. It was just something I wanted to do. And, you know, I, I went in there. And it, 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 it she was also one of the teachers there. And I realized that she just didn't like me. But, but oh. yeah, there was some other stuff that she, as a teacher, that people realized that, you know what, Barrett, you're right. She doesn't like you. Why didn't she like why. you? I don't know. I honestly don't know. Um, but, you know, it, it's fine because I ended up, like I said, I ended up still moving on past that. I ended up calling the games there. Um, I don't know if you ever watch um, Entertainment Tonight. Uh, the, I remember the, that. What, Is it still on? Yeah, still on. The, the host of the show, uh, Kevin Frazier, uh, he, he went to school with me. He and I used to call games together. And um, yeah, so it was it was uh, kind of kind of fun at that moment. That was a fun little moment there. We used to call basketball games together, he and I. But it was it was um, a time where you know I just went for it. I If she said no, she said no. But she gave me a shot and I got to give her credit for that. She did give me a shot to record it. And I proved her wrong. And once I proved her wrong, the rest was history. I was the I was the guy for like the next, I think, three years at you know at school there. So, so what out. came after that? What was, what was next after school? 
After, well, the great thing about it, and this is also for your younger people, especially those in college, I did internships. I did a lot of internships when I was in college. I mean, a lot of them. And I got zero dollars for every one of them. So I was doing the internship to learn and to gain experience and to build relationships. Well, one of the people with whom I built a relationship with was, if you're a sports fan, you know this person, James Brown, the sportscaster. Um, so he, I built a relationship with him. I, I was interning at a DC TV station, WUSA. He was one of the weekend sportscasters. He wasn't, he wasn't the CBS guy that we see now on NFL Today, <laughs> but he was coming up. And he um, took me under his wing and as an intern. Then when I got out of school, he put in a word for me and helped me get a job there. So my first job was at the number one news station in Washington, DC. I was assistant director for the news station. And um, so it, it was partly because he put in a word for me. Then about a year later, he asked me, would you be interested in coming to the network at CBS Sports? And I'm like, are you crazy? This is what I told people I was going to do when I was in college. I didn't yeah. I didn't expect it two years out of college. I honestly didn't. And uh, so, yeah, so then I went up and worked at, at uh, CBS, um, worked for the network after that. So I, another little lesson I just heard is if you think you're passionate about something, even if you have to do it for free and have something else to get by, go and do it. Yeah. I mean, is that what you did? Yeah, that, and that's exactly right. Because here's the thing, especially in media, they realize that there are thousands of people just like you who want that position. So they either are going to pay you very little or pay you nothing as an intern. Take it. <laughs> this, this, you're going to get the experience. And I remember years later, I went back to visit the people at the TV station. After I, after I left them and left CBS, I went back to visit. And I was talking to one of the sportscasters who was there. And I noticed that the interns, when they handed in their work, we, we picked out the highlights for the, for the news. And I, I said, God, they picked out the highlights. Then they went home. I said, they don't even stay to watch the newscast? He said, well, you, you stayed when you were here, didn't you? I said, yeah, I stayed. I wanted to see what my work did. He goes, and you got a job, didn't you? <laughs> so, so exactly. Well, that's, that's <laughs> networking and brand awareness right there, Being it just being in the studio. Yeah, so right, exactly. And it was, I don't know, it's something about, I want to see my work come to fruition, you know? <laughs> I, they, were, they were just doing a job just to do it. And I didn't, I didn't want it to be just that. I wanted to see what my work, because you know, I picked out the highlights. I want to see which ones they use, you know, and stuff like that. So I can see what they like and how, you know, how to, how to move forward from that standpoint. So it was, it was a learning experience for me just hearing him say that. It was like, that was it. You know, that's why I got the job is because I not only did, did my job, but I did a little extra staying beyond that. So what, when you got your first job, paying job, uh -huh. What was your big idea at the time? I mean, what did you think your goal was? What, where were you planning on moving ahead? Or did you even have a plan yet because you were too new to the industry? What did that look like for you when you got well, that Well, that's a great question. Uh, it was, uh, first I wanted to make more money because they weren't paying me hardly anything to start out. <laughs> I, here's the thing, guys. I'm telling you, if you're going to go into the media, love it. Love it. Because I was working, and this is, I'm old. So this was back in the late 80s. But I was working for the number one news station in the nation's capital. My title was assistant director. I was making 13000 a year. Whoa. <laughs> oh, that, 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 that kind of hurts just hearing it. <laughs> I don't think. Yeah. So then, yeah. So of course, like I said, one of my goals was just to get in a position where I can make some more money. But also, I, I wanted to learn because the thing about media is that you got to pay your dues. They always tell you that you got to pay your dues if you're going to move forward in the business. I was fortunate. A lot of people have to pay their dues in very small markets. I was paying it in one of the biggest markets in the world, Washington, D.C. So I was there you know, when a lot of stuff was happening in D.C. in the late 80s. But I was in that market paying my dues. And then, you know, my next job was moving up to New York in CBS. So my first two jobs in the industry were in Washington, D.C. and New York. That hardly ever happens for anyone in the industry. But. I was fortunate enough to have that have that happen that way, and I, you know I'm I'm grateful for the experience because I learned a lot and I learned a lot fast, good and bad. So how did that work? Because it seems 
at least to me, a little almost counterintuitive that you're in such big markets and you're just getting started. And this, I think this is for a college student listening, somebody shifting Ooh. career, somebody starting a media agency, whatever it might be. How did you stand out in such a large market? I would think it would almost be easier to stand out in a smaller market, you know, the big fish in a small pond instead of a small fish in a big pond. How did yeah. you do that? Well, you're, you're right. And, 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 and on, on what you just said there, I'm, this was years, 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 years after I got out of, out of that. I remember meeting a young lady in Macon, Georgia, very small market. She was a reporter. She was on camera. She, she was you know, out there reporting on the scene and she did week, weekend anchoring. This, now keep in mind, this was probably in the two, early 2000s. Yeah, I know it was. It was early 2000s, not the late 80s when I started. She was making $18,000 in the early 2000s and she was on camera. <laughs> so I told you, you got to pay your dues. But she was doing that in the small markets, hoping to move up. Now, with me, in, the, in that big pond that I was in, you're right. How do I stand out? Well, one way I stood out in when I was in D.C. was one to do my job, one, one just to do my job. Another was to do extra. So, for instance, uh, back then we had an arena here uh, in this area, the Capitol Center, which is no longer here, but it's where the, the Washington uh, Bullets used to play basketball and Washington Capitals mm -hmm. played hockey. James Brown would sometimes do remote shoots from there to interview some of the athletes. Every now and then he would call me up and say, hey, are you available to go over there? I, ha I happen to live 10 minutes from the place. Okay, are you able to go over there and help set up this interview for me? And he just did it from the studio. Well, I just set it up where, where I was. Just doing little extra things like that and get, building relationships with, with riding out to the, the park to see the football teams practice and stuff, just learning things helping to set up shows in the studio, getting myself known so that they knew this was the guy. Some The anchors all knew me. They all they all recognized. I remember I saw an anchor at one of the con a conference out in Los Angeles, but this was after I left the station, but she remembered me because we worked together. So, so. Now, in New York, it was harder. It was harder to make myself known um, because you know, so CBS, you're talking the whole network. It's, it's, <laughs> it's real hard to make yourself oh, known. Fortunately, we were in a the department I was in was very, very small. And we were research. And I worked there during the NFL season uh, back in, in 89. And the, the thing about it was that my job was to basically all those stats you hear the, the sports host doing. I was the yeah. one who gave them those stats. You know, I, my job was to compile all their data all week long and make sure. And we were also the ones, if you ever watch those NFL pregame shows, if you see people milling around in the back, that was us yeah. too. So <laughs> that was always us. So that was, you know, that was the part how you make yourself known. You do little things to help out around the set and get things going. And you just make sure you do your job. It, and and I, I work a lot. That's the thing. Make sure that they know that you're willing to do the work. I, I remember telling someone I worked seven days a week there. And I usually don't get home until dark every every day. And someone's like, you work seven days a week? I said, well, let me put you this way. On the weekends, what would I be doing normally? Staying at home, watching games. Well, yeah. you're paying me to come in and, and watch, watch games on the weekend and just pull out stats. And they feed me. So... <laughs> A little then, bonus lunch, dinner, whatever it might right, be. Right, right, a little bonus. So I just, I, it was just, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like it was, you know, construction work because you know, those guys are really working. So <laughs> I just figured it was just, you know, I'm, I'm putting in time watching, watching TV and telling and writing down the things that I thought were, were cool. That's pretty much what I was doing. So it was, but it was, I did enough of it to try to make myself notice. But unfortunately, there was a dark side to things. Some people go a little too far in making themselves notice, meaning that there is that, uh, that, that sucking up aspect. Mm -hmm. That's not me. I'm not, I'm not a guy that's going to suck up. You. But yep. I know people who did that. I know people who did that to move ahead. I also know people who have not, did, not only did that, but they put down other people to the higher ups to make themselves look better. And it ended up costing people their jobs because of things that they did. That stuff like that, I'm not, I'm not in in that in that lane. But I, I did see the, the dark side of it as well. I, I tell people the, I saw the underbelly, and it just depends on what you're willing to do to make yourself notice. I'm not willing to hurt someone else to make myself notice. So, what's 
one or two, well, let's say one of the biggest of the early days that we're talking about right now, as far as bringing a big idea to life, whether it's the career or something else in the media industry or through the media, what is the one thing you learned early on? Like what's one thing that stands out for you that you learned early on? Listen, the one thing that stands, and I still use it to this day, it's funny because when I first started working at a TV station and we were doing uh, some floor directing, just you know, telling people which camera to look at, what, what we're going to next and so forth. And one of the guy, the guy who was training me, he said, a lot of people here are going to tell you what they think you should be doing. You have to learn to turn on the uh-huh machine. So whatever they tell you, just say uh-huh. You already know what your job is. So just do your job. But whatever they tell you, just say uh-huh and just keep doing your job. That's that's the one thing I learned. I still do it to this day. So, so I don't, it's, it's, you don't, that way you don't get into a disagreement with you. Don't argue with them. Just say uh-huh. Let them know you heard them and then just do your job. So that being said, what was the bridge to the social media phase of your career? Talk, talk a little bit about that. How, you know, what was your experience? How did you get into it? When did you realize it was important? Well, just social media. We could talk about a couple other things, but I was thinking well, yeah, social, well, media I mean, first, I mean, yeah. social media. Well, that was pretty simple because I, I really wasn't planning on doing media as a business at that point. I was I was out of television at that time. I was pretty much out of radio too, it, 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 to, mm -hmm. to a degree. And but when social media started coming around with with um, Facebook and MySpace and all those things, and you know, I just did it because everyone else was doing it. And I got in, started getting in touch with old friends, and I said, okay. And I I, I wasn't using it um, for business when it first came out. Then when I started doing more business, I said, okay, I can leverage this to get to get more clients. I can what kind of things were you leveraging? Well, I was doing events. I started doing events and doing them kind of like we're doing right here. And just that I was I wasn't um, you know, we weren't using stream to that, but I, I would do events and I would just do it you know as a live. Or I I, I started I, I a friend of mine saw me working with a group of people. I was coaching them on um on business. And he said, You need to write a book. So I wrote a book, and then another friend and I, because I wrote a book. She said, hey, why don't we do um, a, a blog talk radio show together? So we mm -hmm. did blog talk radio and we started promoting that through our social media. Our oh, my people, God. I remember blog talk. Yeah, you remember blog talk? I mean, the thing about blog talk radio was really just podcasting. That's all, <laughs> that's all it was. It's just that it had a different name. And But the thing is, we started promoting it using our social media to get more people interested in following us. And of course, there weren't at that time, there weren't as many social media channels as there are now. But it was it was just a way for us to leverage it and to bring more people to us. It was a way to attract an audience. And see, when we when we did that, it also gave us a way to engage with them, to connect with them, because just doing the radio show wasn't going to give us a connection. It was just us spreading a message. The social media allowed them to connect with us to to see because it was it was so funny because of social media. I never forget this. It was the funniest thing. I had a friend visiting in town. We were going to an event and she was saying, oh, yeah, you're a celebrity. You do the radio show. I'm like, yeah, whatever. Nobody pays attention to that stuff. So we went to <laughs> we went to the event and we're checking in, getting our tickets. And I said, hey, I'm Barrett Matthews. And the girl goes, Barrett Matthews from the radio show? <laughs> oh, my gosh. And I said, this never happens to me. It never happens. Then we were out that same weekend. We went to go get some lunch. And a lady walks up and says, aren't you Barrett Matthews? I was like, oh, my God, this never happens to me. My friend is laughing hysterically because she, she called me a celebrity. And I'm like, this never happens. But it was because of the social media, us putting ourselves out there, it caused some recognition. Well, it sounds like the, the term, which I don't believe was around back then, the term you platform. You have yes. to have a platform if you want to book, if you want to get out there, you want to share yes. a big idea with the world, help other people share their, theirs. And it sounds like you discovered having a platform, maybe even before you were using the word platform. Would that be correct? That's a great, that's a great point. That's, that's a very good point. I mean, I always feel that you're, you're going to, people are going to consume their information through one media platform or another. Mm -hmm. And I always say you want to put yourself on as many as you can just to make it so you're visible when they're looking where they are looking, we have to stop looking where we think they are. Just go where, where, just put ourselves on different platforms because when they decide to look for something you do, you need to be there. 
when you say look for something you do, do you do professionally or as part of the marketing yes. or, both? Or, or personally? But the, the thing is, it's like if if someone is looking for whatever, if, if you're let's say you're um, a chiropractor and you have yourself, say, on a podcast and you do a podcast all the time and you love doing your podcast and you may have thousands and thousands of downloads. But does that mean that everyone that needs a chiropractor listens to podcasts? No. <laughs> so that's why I say have a presence everywhere. You may want to write a book on, on it. You may want to do a Roku TV channel. You may want to have a bigger social media presence. You may even want to do a documentary showing how you work. Have a presence on all these different platforms because you never know where the audience is looking or where they're listening. Because I always say we do what I call ego based marketing. We, we base our marketing on what makes us feel comfortable. And we don't put ourselves on other platforms to make it so that the people can find us. How do you balance your time between all the platforms? I mean, do you pick something? I'm just going to say like with my LinkedIn to focus 40% of your time on 10% on TikTok. How do you balance it? Because being everywhere takes a lot of work to do it right. I should say to do it right. Well, you know what I do? I hire a team. <laughs> I ha I am I am a firm. My, it's funny. My first the first book I wrote was called Why Didn't You Get It Done. It was on business productivity, and I I coined a phrase that said, "In order to get it done, you don't have to be the one." So basically, what I do is I hire people who are good at what I want done. I, for instance, I, I I podcast. I love the podcast. I don't like editing. I didn't like editing when I was in school. So what did I do? I hired people to do my editing for me for my podcast. Why? Because they're good at it and I just paid them to do it. Uh, it could be something like someone may want to hire a social media manager. Same thing. They will post and see a, social, a good social media manager knows when to post, what to post, how often to post. And if you get someone who knows that you won't rack your brain trying to do that and run your business in doing whatever it is that you do well together. Whatever you do well, that's what people pay you for. That's what mm -hmm. people pay you for. So if you do it well, do that. Let someone else do what they do well. Stop trying to kill your time by trying to figure out something that is not your lane. Let someone who runs in that lane run <laughs> and, and they can carry the baton for you too. That, so that's how I, I don't worry about the, the time because I'm focusing on what I do well and letting other people focus on what they do well. Well, once they're out there on social media, what advice do you have for real engagement, actual conversations, a back and forth dialogue, not just boom, pumping information out to get a couple of likes. How can you create, how can people listening create or watching create engagement? Ask, on social questions. Media? ask, ask questions that require answers. Um, Ask questions to, to get people to respond to you, not just a yes or no question. Ask people to you to comment, to give. And then guess what? Follow up with them. When they say something, acknowledge them. Let them know that you actually understood. And, and don't get into arguments disagreeing with them, if you, even if you don't agree with them. Dig into their point, maybe. And find out, you know, why they say that, what they mean, because people want to know that you hear them. They want to know that you hear them. So if they know that you hear them, even if they disagree with you, they're there for a reason. You hit something. You hit something, mm -hmm. hit some button. So guess what? Some people have audiences that disagree with them all the time, but they never leave. They, they never leave. They keep coming back, even though they disagree with you. They may call you all types of names in the background, but they keep coming back. And because you 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 hit that button, it makes them want to keep coming back. We all, I mean, think about it. If you're watching any type of sports, television, or political stuff or whatever, there are people out there that you can't stand, but you listen to them. I remember, you know, growing up and, and listening to sports, people used to hate Howard Cosell, but they would sure listen to him all the time. <laughs> so it's just the thing is you want to engage people. You want to make people feel that you hear them, whether you agree with them or not, or whether they agree with you or not. Just let them know that you hear them and give them, give them a platform by asking them questions that make them engage. Don't give them, don't ask them, say, you know, do you like when it snows outside? No, ask them. So what, what type of, what time do you like it to snow each year? What do you like to do when it snows? Get them to answer something because now they feel a part of it. And another thing that can help with it is surveys. 
surveys can, can really do a lot. If you do a survey, you get people to chime in to see and so they can see where the poll is going and where, where how, how far it's going up and get their answers and so forth. And that way you can find they feel they feel a part of something. One of the best things I advise people to do when they're trying to think of uh, a, a title for their book or for their podcast or for you know, for an event they're doing. I said, put it out there to your audience. Let them answer. Because now, whatever you pick, it could be something that you picked on your own. But <laughs> the fact is that they feel that they have engaged. They have a part of it now. Or when you say, hey, help me name some topics for my podcast. Well, now when you let them know, hey, I'm going to say I'm going to use all these topics. Now they want to say, listen in to when your when yours comes up and I'll give you credit for it. You know, something like that. It lets it makes people feel a part of what you're doing. When they feel a part of it, they're not going anywhere. How do you draw the line between personal and professional engagement? Because there's things I know like with networking, a virtual conversation and in-person conversation. Some some coaches say talk about sports or find a common ground about where, where you like to vacation, whatever it might be. But I've always thought that doesn't move the needle. Talk well, about business or bit stuff, but where do you balance? Let's talk about sports and there's a reason to follow up with you and call you on Monday because we can create real engagement. Where do you balance the two yeah, personal and professional? You, you really do have great questions. I love your questions. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. This, the, on that topic, I used to do a lot of social engagement on my social media platforms. And I talked to one of my coaches and I looked at what he does and every one of his posts are about business because he wants the people to know this is why we're here. This is why we're here. And th that doesn't mean he doesn't socialize with people, but mm -hmm. those people he socializes with, they already know how to read them privately. You know, <laughs> So they already know. If we're, if we're here for business, let's talk business. Now, now every now and then, you may throw a you know, softball to them and, and say something like, hey, maybe on a weekend or something, say, what was your favorite cartoon growing up? You know, just to get them all engaged. And then after that, you go right back to the business again. Because you don't want to get them thinking that this is all fun and games. You really want them focusing on the business aspect. of, And they, you want them to take you seriously. That's the main thing. You want them to take you as someone that they can come to for business. You're just using that platform to, to share your business with them. But you don't want to make them think that this is still, I know it's called social media, but you don't necessarily yeah. have to use it in that regard every time. Are you more, I'm guessing that I, the answer would be yes. Are you more business on LinkedIn and a little bit less more on Facebook? Because I know after asking that question, I will put if I'm out of town for three days just to get away and not have the hustle and bustle of downtown. I get a lot of comments. And I think with that, some of those comments then turn into, oh, I looked at your profile. I didn't realize you were doing this or you have a new podcast out or something else. Do you have a balance between platforms and one you use for more or less of and that and professional? That has changed over the years. Um, it used to be Facebook was my jam, man. I was I was on Facebook all the time. Don't get me wrong, I still do have a Facebook presence, but mm -hmm. I use LinkedIn more because LinkedIn brings me more serious business people. I mean, that's what it's for. Let's be honest. <laughs> LinkedIn LinkedIn is for business, and Facebook can be used for business, and that I think that's the big difference. People don't go to to LinkedIn to really build social relationships. They, they go there for business. People go to Facebook for social relationships, and sometimes they can get some business done out of it as well. I use both, but I, I go to LinkedIn more now. Now, keep in mind, though, with LinkedIn, as far as having effectiveness, there are certain times when you should post, and they really only want you posting once a day on LinkedIn. So mm -hmm. it doesn't do you good to just stay on LinkedIn all day posting because it's really not helping your brand. It doesn't make you look good. It makes you kind of look like you're you're thirsty. Well, you, <laughs> you would know better than me. Doesn't the algorithm spank you for that? You it does. too much on LinkedIn? It does. but And it also makes you look bad. It makes Because it, it makes you look like you're just trying to keep putting stuff out there. And that if you're serious about business, it doesn't that doesn't look good. It doesn't mm -hmm. look good. Whereas... You know, Facebook, you do it all day long, every hour on the hour if you want to, but and they don't care. But it, it's just, a, it's a different, and you have to know which one you're dealing with and what audience you're dealing with and who your audience is. It's it's a lot that you need to know going into it. And, you know, that's one of the things that I, you know, I that's why I say, 
hire someone that knows that stuff, let them handle it. So you don't have to focus on things like that. When you know, if you're good at something, focus on what you're good at. Well, for people watching and listening right now, as far as your audience that you mentioned, what advice do you have for finding your audience in the first place and then finding out where they hang out to go be with them? How do you, what would you say if someone says, uh, I, I kind of talk great. to everybody, but who, how do you find them and how do you decide who they are and how do you find where they are? Great question. Now, how do you find who they are? Think about who your best customer has been. Who is that best? When I say best, I'm not talking about just the person that pays you a lot. I'm talking about that person that gives you the least headache. I'm talking about the person that you didn't have to do a whole lot to make them a customer. The person that refers you to other people. The person that is a raving fan. Who is that person? And if you don't know them yet, if you haven't had that experience yet, in your mind, imagine who that person is and write it down. Mm. How, how old are they? Where do they live? Are they married? Do they have kids? How many kids? What kind of work do they do? What are their spending habits? Where do they shop? Do they travel? Where do they travel? All of these things, write them all down because that is your client avatar. That is the person that you are looking to serve. What is their income? How, you know, how, much, how much disposable income do they have? What do they like to spend on? All of these things. Write them all down because that is your client avatar. If you don't already have that person, figure it out who that person is. Write it down. Use your imagination. Guess what? It may evolve. It may change as you go. But have someone you want to focus on. Now, the second part of that question, this is where I challenge the paradigm that has been taught over and over again with people. We've been taught, find out who that client avatar is and go where they are. I say no. Find out who your client avatar is and make it so they can find you. They are looking for what you offer. Make it so you can be found. This is why I tell people to make sure you are on different platforms. Because if they're looking, they, they want to find you. If you're going around just trying to find them, you look desperate because you're just trying to find someone to buy. I'm, I'm going to use an example. Let's say McDonald's, for instance. McDonald's doesn't come knocking on your door and saying, hey, we have some French fries to sell down the street. No, McDonald's mm -hmm. makes it so that when you want French fries, you can always find the McDonald's. <laughs> so the thing is, make it so you can be found and not that you have to go hunting for people all the time. Make it so your business can be found because when they, when you, when it's like when, if you're shopping for something, if, if you're shopping for, I don't know, some Captain Crunch cereal and you go to the grocery store, you go to the grocery store looking for it. And when you find it, you are happy. It's not like they're coming outside saying, hey, Captain Crunch here, Captain Crunch here. No, they make it so you can find it when you're looking for it. Make it so businesses, make it so your business can be found when people are looking for it. Because those are the people that are going to pay you. When they know that they want something and they can find it, they will pay you. A friend of mine, he said that people will pay you today if you can solve their problem today. How do you become more findable? Because mentioning that makes me think of a coach I hired, and it, it's not an inexpensive coach I hired recently. Okay, and I was looking for I was I don't want this this level coach. Someone I said I described the avatar of the coach I wanted, and found it. And when I found him, I gladly paid the fee, and it's worth it. It's going to be an ROI. How do you make yourself, or how can someone make themselves findable instead of? doing those automated messages I get on LinkedIn now. And I use Mark J as my first name. No human's going to type in Mark J, only a bot will. So I know it's a bot right away. But I get right. these automated messages. Boom, let's have set up a call. Let's do a first, let's do a call. Let me tell you more about what I do, which is annoying. How do you become findable without being annoying? Well, Mark, that, that's easy because um, that's that's a softball for me because media, <laughs> media is the best way to do so. Um, we, here's the thing. Everybody, and I mean everybody, consumes information through at least one form of media. It could be books. It can be magazines, newspapers. It could be newsletters, blogs. It could be podcasts. It could be YouTube streaming, streaming uh, webinars. It could be documentaries. It could be television, whatever. Everybody consumes information through at least one form of media. Many of us, several forms of media. Mm -hmm. You, so, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, you need to make sure that you 
are on multiple platforms so that people can find you. If you are only on one platform of media and people are looking for you, they will not find you because you are really not findable. You have made like it goes back to what I said earlier, ego based marketing. We're, we market ourselves in what makes us feel comfortable, but that's not where the people are comfortable and looking. So if you are if you're trying to get the people to pay you, make yourself findable for them when they're looking for you. They're not always going to be looking for you. So just make it so that you have. a Now, I'm not saying dominate the marketplace. because A lot of people get that confused. You don't have to dominate the marketplace. I'm okay. saying have a presence. So one of the best ways to do that is to repurpose your content, repurpose your content. For instance, we are doing this show right now. Now, I don't know if you're doing this or not. You probably are. You can take this content if recorded. You can take that. You can take it in the shorts. You can put the shorts on YouTube. You can take the shorts and put them on on your social media channels. You can transcribe it. You can turn it into an ebook if you want to. You can actually put up another camera and do a video, do a, a documentary on the making of your show. There, there's so many different things you can do with it. And you created several content platforms just by one thing that you just did. So when people, I hear people say, oh, God, it sounds like so much. You, can, you don't have to do a whole production for each one. You just made one piece of content and you repurpose it and put it on different platforms and make it into different, different channels for people to pay attention to. That way, when the people go where they want to find information, you're there. Well, tell me if I'm on track and I'm on target with what you just said. I love it because repurposing so many people... I know I did in the early days. They think that I have to write my LinkedIn post, my Facebook post. I got to shoot something for TikTok. I got to do something for YouTube. And with what you just said, if I'm right, this right here is 45 minutes of our time. Oh, it can my be gosh. used across all platforms and repurposed. You can put it all, put it, the, the last 30 seconds, you could make that into a YouTube short. The last 30 seconds, you could make it into a, a blog post if you wanted to. I mean, you see, I hope really the audience is understanding this. Stop overthinking it. Stop overthinking it. It's not that difficult. Repurpose your content. People do it all the time, all the time. And here's the thing. Let's say you took all of your shows and you transcribed them and made them into eBooks, made them into blog posts. You could go from the one that you did at the beginning when you started and put it at the end on on once, so people don't even know that they're listening to something that they've already heard before. <laughs> what are other ways to repurpose it? Well, you can actually one of the best ways actually is by leveraging other your other relationships. For instance, I could leverage my relationship with you, take some of my content, and have it put on on your on your site, or have you, have you put some of mine? Just give you credit, give each other credit for it. And say, hey, this is something that my that my friend Mark did, and this is something my friend Barrett did, and we can have you guys pay attention. And what it does is not only gives you some credibility by having someone else on it, but it brings also your audience to them as well, and vice versa. So it's. Would that be co-marketing? I mean, that's a great idea. Yeah, you can call it however you want. Yeah, <laughs> or, or or yeah, or collaboration or however you want to do it, or swapping however you want to do it. But it, it basically it leverages two different audiences for each other, but it also leverages different content that they might not have heard before. Well, we've covered a lot of ground in a relatively short period of time. I'd love to know when it comes to bringing a big idea, starting a business, a career in media, whatever it might be using and leveraging media if you were to tell somebody watching and listening at least start with this one thing and i know it's a big question but at least what? start doing this one thing what would you say to start it, with it's a question i get asked all the time so it's fine um i always say start with a podcast start with a podcast okay. why a podcast because it's the easiest platform for you to start on and some would some would be scared when i say that but think about it it's easy for you to talk about what you love. It's easy for you to talk about something that you enjoy. If I said write a book on what you enjoy, that's going to require you to do a lot of thinking. But if just like we just hit did right here, we just talked for over a half an hour on things that we love. It's easy to do. Now, if I take that podcast, 
Now, if I put a camera in front of me, I can have some YouTube videos. I can have a YouTube for my whole podcast. I can have a YouTube for the shorts. I can put it on my social media, the shorts on Facebook, on LinkedIn, whatever. I can also take that and transcribe it, turn it into a book, turn it into a blog, turn it into an ebook. You see, just on that one podcast, I can do a whole lot. But you start with the podcast because it's easy for you to talk about it. It doesn't require you to do a lot of thinking because it's something you enjoy talking about. That is Excellent way to close coming full circle. Thank you so much for being here. If people want to find you online, another possibly big question, which are the platforms you like them to find you on the most? Well, uh, LinkedIn is probably the most. And of course, my website, www.mediabosspro.com, mediabosspro.com. They can find me there. And also, um, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to give a gift to your audience if that's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Sure. Well, I have coming up um, in early December, and so you guys are going to get a real I have the Create Your Podcast Weekend. It's the whole weekend showing you how to start your own podcast from soup to nuts, from A to Z, from start to finish. Learn how to start your own podcast over. It's going to be two days. We're not going all day. It's a few hours each day. But the price of the event is $997 for the whole, whole event. But if you go to createyourpodcastweekend.com, real simple, createyourpodcastweekend.com, and you put in the code podcast, it goes from $997 to only $97. It's actually going to be my Black Friday special, but your audience is getting it right now. Awesome. Thank you very much. Again, I appreciate the time. No problem. Thank you. And scene. And <laughs> scene.